Thank you, Charles. I appreciate it. I'm Mike. I'm an alcoholic. I uh, <clears throat> was thinking about what to uh, do a topic on, and it's something that I need to hear, um, and I think it's something that everybody in recovery has to do the best they can to keep in the middle of their mind um, about what a part I play in my recovery. Um, and the first thing that comes to mind is something that somebody said a long time ago, continues to say today, if I'm starving, I can't lock myself in a closet and expect God to shove an Oscar Mayer through the keyhole. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, what that little analogy tells me is that I can't just sit quietly in a chair in an AA meeting and expect God to do everything about my recovery. I play a part in my recovery. I think it's important to say it out loud and hear myself say it because my observation has been a lot of newcomers feel like they're sold that if they can just come here, their problems will just miraculously go away. And then they're dismayed and blame it on AA and say AA didn't work when they find themselves drunk half a time, a dozen times in rapid succession. And the fact of the matter is, is that once I take responsibility for my disease, I also have to take responsibility for my recovery. I think it's important to say that and the reason I wanted to talk about playing my part and talk about challenges that come up in recovery because calamities can come up in recovery and oftentimes they're not the big things that come along. Sometimes they can be, for us, the, the tough ones are small things that come along uh, that I don't feel are, are important enough to deal with. But uh, the, the book warns me, again, there's a warning for everything and a promise for everything and one of the warnings is is that these termites can ceaselessly devour any quality of life I may have, meaning I need to deal with things as I go along and nothing is too small to deal with because if I deal with these things as I go along, number one, it doesn't build up on me and take down the big oak tree of my recovery like the analogy of the termites. But another thing is it, is it teaches me that... Um, you know, on a daily basis, whether I think I need to or not, I need to keep doing these things because the insurance that I pay in doing my recovery comes to my aid in a time of need. Um, like I said, calamities can be small. I can get all in a twist over a hangnail or she didn't text me back in 8.5 minutes. Uh, you know, so the, the problems that I have today are nothing compared to what they were when I got here. And I think that that's one of the reasons they say we don't shut the door on the past. But the truth and the good news is I don't have to walk back through that door either. But sometimes I need to look all the way from back from whence I came to see that I have made progress. That's my point. So I want to talk about matching calamity with serenity and I want to talk about a realistic matching concept. I'm going to run through this real quick. I don't want to take too long to do this topic because it's one that everybody can talk about. Whether you're new or got a long-term sobriety, whether you come from Yale or jail or Penn State to State Penn, this is something that everybody in recovery deals with. Uh, page 68 in our book talks about matching calamity with serenity, but it also talks about what I was talking about, about the Oscar Mayer coming through the keyhole and that I play a part. It talks about just to the extent that I do as I think he would have me, does he enable me to match calamity with serenity? And so many times when I would read that early on, I would just read that God is going to match my calamity with serenity. And I looked over the first part of that sentence, which says, just to the extent that I do as I think he would have me. And there I am, like Bill in his story on 13, where he talks about when in doubt I was to sit quietly, ask him for the strength and direction to meet my problems as he would have me. You know, that's, that's something that I neatly evaded because I didn't want to take responsibility early on. Thank God I finally came around. I mean, thank God I got a sponsor that tried to keep me in the book instead of co-signing my bullshit. They would tell me things I needed to hear, not necessarily things I wanted to hear. So when I read that page, though, it has an instantaneous feel to it. And I think I, and, and I've, and I've actually heard newcomers talk about, well, man, he didn't match my calamity with serenity. I'm out of here. This ain't working. Sometimes it's on God's time. There's another part in the book, it talks about even more of an instantaneous sounding matching calamity with serenity is on 100 where it talks about follow the dictates of a higher power and you will presently live in a new and wonderful world no matter what your present circumstances. 
I mean, there's no other way to look at it. When it says presently, presently, somebody's snapping their fingers and something is fixed. That's what I hear when I read that page. But if I read it a little closer, what it's talking about is if I'm in a calamity, whether it be huge or small, whether it be termite or huge, if I'm in a calamity, when it talks about I will presently live in a new and wonderful world, no, ma no matter what my present circumstances, he can't be talking about uh, somebody snapped their fingers and did the right incantation and all is right with the world. I think the present, the new and wonderful world, the presently live in a new and wonderful world is the fact that now I have hope, whereas I had none before. So if I'm going through a challenge in recovery now, I've had a past of successes in recovery, or I see other people that it's worked in their life if I'm new, and I believe that they believe, and if something comes up in recovery, I've been trained to believe that if I just keep sticking this out, it will be okay. And I think that's what he's talking about. The present live in a new and a wonderful world is one that there's hope if I just stick it out and don't cash in my chips and go get another drink and ultimately get another white chip. Because I don't want you all to have to look at me and say, hey, should we order white chips for Mike instead of World? You know, I don't want to be that guy. And there's a real simple way for me to keep from being that guy. If I keep doing this thing, I don't have to be the white chip dude. But a real, more realistic matching concept beyond the idea of what I think I hear when I read those pages, which is presently, presently, and an instantaneous matching, is on another part of the book. And, it, and this is the most realistic matching concept, and I think that this is what anybody who stays around recovery has to learn 100%. And, and, and keep that in the forefront of my mind. And it's going to be on 117 where it's talking about many of the old problems will still be here. This is as it should be. This will be part of my education. Thus, I'll be learning how to live. These workouts will be regarded, like it says, as part of my education. I'll be learning how to live. And I will capitalize on these things if I'm in earnest. That means serious in intention. And it said a better way of life will emerge when these are overcome. And what that is saying is calamity with serenity is matched through my perseverance and relying on God to lead me to do the right thing. That's the whole point of this entire topic, that the realistic matching concept has to do with, one, me doing my part and not just locking myself in a closet and expecting Big G to do it all. Two, realizing that it's the small things that can tri trip me up, and I can make small things into calamity. But whether it's big or small, a lot of times, most of the times, well, all the times, nothing is going to be instantly fixed. I have to go through things, then I come out on the other side, and my training in recovery kicks in. And what is that training in recovery? It trains me to thank God that the calamity is over instead of reaching around and packing myself on the back saying, look what I did. I matched my calamity, because that's what I will do. And I've seen a lot of people do that. And I've seen what happens to those people. So I've been trained to thank God even when I don't want to. I've been trained to come to meetings and work these steps even when I don't think I need to. Because, and, and, and here's, here's, here's the real reason that this comes to bear. And this is why the steps circle around on itself. Somebody 12-step me and then I can carry a message. Because what happens when I overcome a challenge in recovery and my calamity's been matched? I'm right there on page 63 where it talks about victory over my difficulties bears witness to those that I would help. So what it's saying is I need to come back in meetings and say I had a challenge. And it may not have sounded like a big deal, but I blew it up into Mount Everest. And I was in calamities, but I allowed God to help me to do the next right thing, asking for strength and direction, and now I'm on the other side of it, and I have my serenity back. But while I was going through it, it sure wasn't no fun. But let me tell you something. I know what would have been less fun, cashing in and going to getting drunk. So that's the message I have to carry, and I have a duty to carry to newcomers, that perseverance is the key. And I go through challenges just because I've got this many years don't mean that I'm uh, uh, absolved of life's challenges because life still shows up. That's another thing that I must get if I'm going to stay around here. So that's the topic, matching calamity with serenity, the realistic matching concept, and I want to end it with that, and I've had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. And I'll